<laughs> yeah, how it was out there in the yeah, world. Yeah, how it was like as a um, as an example of that connection between like I just found it amazing that generation like Zoomers would get interested in a film like that, but I think ultimately it's because everyone every generation just loves weird things. I think that's it, and if it's if it's weird enough, it's okay. Yes. It's yes, when it's no, not weird enough. It just doesn't, you know, it's got to be really weird, I guess. Yes, yes. And nobody remembers, nobody remembers things that are good but not very odd. That's some... Um, <laughs> right. With, yes, precisely. <laughs> Anyhow, I've, um, I've to lose my notes, so I probably won't, uh, won't ask you as many questions as I planned, but I can remember most of it. So... <laughs> I did want to start with talking about possibly in Michigan, sure. which I'm sure you'll you've talked to death about, so you're probably a bit tired of it. But um, I can do it though. Okay, thank you so much. Well, uh, I suppose I wanted to start with the most obvious and boring question: uh, Did anything in particular inspire it? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I I was when I was young. Well, in my, I felt like my twenties were really rough. Like I, they were um, they were like war. They were like being going to war, and oh. um, I don't. I mean, I, I you know, it's just fine. I mean, my life is a totally normal life. You know, I have an exceptionally happy little world here, but uh, it, you know, there's times when it has not been so easy, and um, there's a lot of violence in my twenties. Mm -hmm. So I well, also. That... Mm -hmm. Oh no! I beg your pardon. Um... <laughs> Uh, so I dated a guy who killed the other gal he was seeing, and that had a big impact on me. Oh yes, you did another film about that, didn't you? The, yeah. the man who the man who kept the, his ex in his freezer or something. His closet. <laughs> oh right. Oh. <laughs> yeah. That, that story, that not... even though it's uh, bizarre, it doesn't have as many views <laughs> as yes. possibly. I think possibly yes. also a story, and somehow it just makes it so much easier to digest. Mm. And songs, uh, and songs. Oh uh, yes, the, the I think the music and the um, uh, sort of the, the the lilting singing. There's nothing else like it. I, I I I don't think there's another film like it, simply because of the way the actresses deliver their lines. Never seen anything like that. Um, <laughs> Thank you. On the subject, I actually wanted to ask. Um, so the music in that film was was composed by Clarence, excuse me, Karen Skladany, wasn't it? That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yes. And you also worked with her on Beneath the Skin. Is that correct? Uh, only that one song. And she had already written that beforehand. So she gave me a, um, a little tape about of all the songs that she and Alice Malloy, who had this group called the Guyettes. And they would swarm around Ohio, Cleveland, Ohio. And so I asked her, I loved them. And so I asked them if I could maybe use one of their film, their songs in this new piece. And I didn't have an idea what it, I look, what I get from them. But I, I figured the G.I. Joe, even though I never talked about a G.I. Joe, a reason to I thought it was so good you know just the song they were Karen was really as good a songwriter as I think there ever was I mean I don't oh. know if she wrote songs after possibly very much I mean I mean I don't know you know I kind of lost track with her and now I can't really find her yes there's almost nothing about her online uh yeah. can you tell me how you met her yeah, I met her at a party on a riverboat on the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland. And she and Alice Malloy, the Guyettes, these two had all this audio tape hair that was streaming down and they were singing a cappella. And they were uh, just remarkable, I thought. And I just thought that there was nothing like them that I'd ever seen before. And oh. the words were so clever that... I, don't, I, uh, I, I came, came up to them afterwards and I got their address, their, their phone number, so I could contact. With, they seemed perfectly reasonable, to, happy to do it because I was a professor and they had just graduated. So they were like 10 years younger than me. And so they, they, I, didn't, I didn't pay them for it. I just 
because I had no thought I would ever make any money. In fact, I don't make very much money off my work. That's the fact. <laughs> also, I put it online, so it doesn't help. But yeah, but I mean, I sell it sometimes. But you know, I don't do it for the money because I do it because I feel like I have things I have to get rid of in my system, and I got to get them out, and they 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 mm -hmm. help if I clarify them in my work. Yes, no, I'm sure that's a lot of your work does seem to have a lot of seem to be very, very personal and very much working through particular issues. Um, mm -hmm. What really struck me in that regard was we were hardly more than children, which um, mm -hmm. it, what really stuck with me about that film is the way you talked about it. what if I hadn't woken up? What if I hadn't smelled the blood? Because when we endure something like that, that is what our mind does. It uh, We just ask ourselves over and over, what if things had been slightly different? I know just that's happened. Slightly. That's right. Isn't that true? I think it's true, Simon. Yes, it absolutely is. It, you just get, even if it ends, turns out well, you're just plagued by these thoughts of what if, what if. Yeah. It's, it's happened to me over much less traumatizing things than that. So that really resonated with me. <laughs> uh -huh. Thank you. Um, yeah, that was Diane remarkable. Diane Messinger, uh, she, her paintings were why I did it. I, I also thought that people should hear, you know, how many times in one night you could almost be killed hmm. by a legal no. abortion, you know. Absolutely. I mean, it's just not one time. I mean, like almost everyone there killed her <laughs> a little bit at a time. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Was who? Uh, so, Di what did you say the uh, her name, name was? Di Mess Messinger. Uh, M -E -S -S -I -N -G -E -R. M-E-S-S-I-N-G-E-R. And her okay. paintings, when she gave me permission to use her paintings, that was the big thing because I felt her paintings really were very much like my work. They were mm. women standing around, I'd say waiting for Prince Charming, but sort of like there and they're sometimes they look at each other they seem to all know the story but they don't really talk or they don't say anything or they're just standing in their own worlds and they're in a fog that nowhere else is no one else is around but there's many of them and they're sometimes very strange you know they don't have bodies or they don't have you know arms or legs or you know, silly things so her work was so much like my thinking about how you deal with stress and trauma you just stand around and assume that somebody must understand what you're talking about <laughs> oh, absolutely absolutely so diane messenger messing up i've written it down don't worry um it's uh, so messenger, when yeah. when were you introduced to her work um, well, she was the one who had the abortion, but her work oh, developed right, yes. over time. And um, when she, she said I could use it, I, I, that was the big clincher. She didn't want her story associated with it, the abortion associated with it. But at the end yeah. of the piece, she did. So I put that line in that she didn't remember it, but I did. You know, oh. I remembered everything. But also... She had been really brutally raped a few years afterwards, too, and she stayed with me for six months. So, I mean, it was a big walloping blow, but they were both impacted me because she was my closest friend. And people in here, you know, they were all standing around like her paintings, right? And um, because she doesn't remember things when they got that period was too traumatic for words. So she asked me, where did I stay after I got out of the hospital and after the gas man who... Then they used to have gas meters inside your house. And so he came in and he raped her and she literally almost died. And uh, she asked me, where did I stay when I was recovering? And I said, you stayed with me <laughs> for oh six months. Wow. So oh, I good. think it helps to, it's hard to keep, uh, to can remember some things and what, I'm sure she remembers the rape because it was, but um, just how simple it was just to try to survive, just try to survive. Yes, I'm sure. Yes, that's, um, good heavens. Yeah, so there's a lot of these uh, dark things behind your work, I suppose, but they, it makes it so powerful. There are a lot of dark things and, 
even today they're not so dark you know like Mm -hmm. even for me to do hardly more than children it's rather upbeat and kind of fun at times and um Mm -hmm. Uh, even I've been afraid has, was, has, even though it's about a serious subject, like I'm afraid of what you might do, mm. well, afraid I might kill you. I mean, there are <laughs> lines in that that are very real. Yes, and, I'm sure. um, <laughs> and so, I mean, there's some funniness to it because I have all these legs kicking in front of this weird house and these mouths that are screaming, but you know, I don't mm. know. I, not sure if I will stay on that. I think I have more things to say about violence and women that are darker than than that. But that was sort of a piece I sort of did in response to his TikTok and YouTube notoriety. Oh. There was really? Some, yeah, it was a lot to take in. People would write me constantly and call, not call, but email me to, uh, you know, just to say things. Like they liked me so much. <laughs> yes, internet fame does that. <laughs> but um, and, and that was done in response to that. I, I've been afraid. I well, I did it because I was working on a piece about women that had been abused, and I realized that I couldn't have a man hurt them. I couldn't possibly, for some reason, I could do it. But I I couldn't have some of the things that these women were talking about have actually happened in a film. Not only that, I couldn't cast a woman to be in the film who was being hurt like that because I figured that abuse happens in cracks and not huge crevices. It's like a crack that gets bigger by blow or by words or till you're standing on the brink of something and your breath will just topple you over. So I couldn't do that to any woman. So I thought, I'm just standing still. I've been working for like seven, eight months of doing nothing. That I can really do, and then I started playing with my cell phone. Okay, so you did that. Did you do that on your phone then? That phone, that and video? also I had an assistant when I couldn't do things on my phone. I'd have her do it. Okay. So, yeah. Because I, I, it did strike me that film how it almost feels like uh, it feels very modern, like with all the little computer graphics and the three D animation. Yeah. It, it very much feels like your work has come into the twenty first century. Yeah, I I don't know if it's going to stay there, but it it is there in that piece. That's true. But it was the only way I could talk about those subjects, you know. Mm. Yeah, well, a lot of uh, innovation does come through necessity. I just think it's funny because possibly in Michigan, it just oozes an 80s aesthetic all the way through. And I think (laughs) clearly evolved very, very strongly. Thank Mm. you. Um, uh, so, um, circling back to, uh, possibly in Michigan, uh, can you, I also wanted to ask about the other actress in it, Jill Sands. Uh, you Uh, were, yes, yes, you worked with her on three shorts, didn't you? Yeah, actually for something for the Museum of Modern Art in France too. Just a little Uh, audio thing that had visuals and I just sent it, sent it to the museum. Okay. um, The airwaves. Right. And uh, can you um, uh, can you tell me how you met her? Well, I, like I met her at an a, a, a opening, a party. And, um, you know, she was beautiful and unique. And I went up to her right away and I said, would you be in a video of mine? And she looked at me and she said, yes. Oh. Just like oh, that. Great friend of mine. In fact, she helps me edit when I get towards the end of a piece, not at the beginning. But when I get to the very end, she helps me tighten things up. Hmm. She's a dear friend. Oh, that's excellent. Have you uh, thought about putting her in another video? She won't let me now. (laughs) All right. Hmm. Well, you should make it clear to how much people loved her in, uh, possibly in Michigan. Like they were both. She has fans. But she, she does. She does. It's really oh. something. She's very communicative as opposed to me. Mm. And uh, I believe I read somewhere that she said in um, the comment section of uh, possibly in Michigan, she mentioned that the line, love shouldn't cost an arm and a leg, w- was summed up the point of the film. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but that's what I read somewhere. Yeah, that's what she says. She's very, well, it's true. I think it's, some, you know, it's my protest, you know, that love, 
You shouldn't have two choices, both of them which are terrible and involve cutting you up. Yes, absolutely. Um, <laughs> well, that was my friend <laughs> Diane Messinger's dream after she was uh, raped by the guy who pretended to be a gas man. Uh, she was in uh, the hospital. What? And she doesn't remember it, of course, but then, you know, it was, she's, it's a dream. But I remember it, and I wrote it down, and later I pulled it up. Okay, so what, what was it she dreamt again, that line? She dreamt uh, you have uh, the guy who raped her get, said, you have two choices. One, I'll eat oh. you now, or two, I'll cut your arms and legs off and eat them slowly. And she asked him why, and he said in a very deep voice, for love. And she kept asking him why, and he kept saying, for love. Oh, goodness. That's... Um... Oh, it's, it's uh, heavy to think that, uh, I mean, thinking of it, possibly in Michigan is also very lighthearted. So it's funny to think <laughs> that even even a line of it could have come from such a dark place. It's, um, but oh, I but suppose oh, that. the cannibal story is true, too. Oh, uh, is that the, um, the, the chap who murdered his girlfriend, or is this someone else? Uh, this is, uh, no, this is another story. Um, this woman who lived in Ohio, she uh, was dating this guy who lived in Colorado, and she was about ready to go visit him. And she read on the front page of the Plain Dealer in Ohio that, uh, that he had been arrested, and they found six women that he had eaten, the bones of six women that he had eaten in his basement. <clears throat> Good heavens. So I took that story instantly, because the piece was never going to be about cannibalism. I mean, I'm much too sweet and you know, like kind of like normal to do a piece on cannibalism. But when the piece was going and Diane had, had I remembered her dream. And then this woman said this, I went, it's gotta be about cannibals. And then I shot the end. Yeah. Um, uh, so this probably, uh, probably shouldn't ask this, but do you remember the, the, the name of the man? Uh, no. I don't, but somebody wrote me saying that they found it in the Cleveland plane dealer. Okay, well, I'm sure I'm sure someone. Well, we shouldn't remember the name of people like that anyway. <laughs> mm, dreadful, just dreadful. Um, so you know, yeah. Mm, so I think it's uh, I think it's safe to say that the uh, tribulations that women go through in their lives is a very a strong element of all your work, or most of it. Yeah. Uh, is it? Uh, You've probably heard this question a hundred times because we live in a politically charged era, but is it safe to call your work feminist or is that too simple? Well, I, I, I've accepted the word. I mean, I definitely mm. think, I think, Simon, I think I make work as though I'm talking to women mostly. Mm, absolutely. But it, it doesn't seem to affect how men like the work. No, so, I don't think it does. But they're often killers, and they're often awful. But you know, it doesn't seem to men don't seem to mind. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. Um, we're about the worst kind of masculinity, you know. We're talking mm, absolutely about killers and bugs and pathetic people, even if they're smart, <laughs> cute. <laughs> they're awful. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And toxic masculinity is a very real thing. Toxic is what they call it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a very, very real thing. Um, but when I first, I, think possibly I didn't think I was making a feminist piece. I was just making, trying to kill these people that had been so brutal in my world. Hmm. I was trying to check them out, but they never disappeared. They would <laughs> always pop back, you know, even after they kill them and eat them. And, you know, then he's at the window. You know, and he's smoking his pig as he's for, transformed into a pig who has a cigarette. So he's never the boogeyman of women's boogeymen's never seem to totally disappear. Absolutely. I think it's true with people who are anywhere other than if you're in a privileged position in society. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think it's it's something every woman has to put up with to some degree in their yes, life. I yeah, and nowadays even young people have to put up with it just for being young. <laughs> it's like, it's got like, what is the problem? The future of the world is yeah. to be chopped off their feet all the time. Mm. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. So then a real problem. Uh, but um, 
Another recurring element I noticed in your uh, work, though, is, um, and perhaps I'm reaching here uh, or misinterpreting, but at least uh, at least in Not a Jealous Bone and Some Dark Place, I noticed the recurring fear, uh, recurring theme of the fear of getting old or aging. Um, oh, yeah. oh, you know what, though, Simon, is that I don't think, I mean, I don't like the idea of being in pain or being old. There's no question about it. I think it's, you know, limiting. But at the same time, I worked with old people in my 20s for, I think it's like 11 years. I worked as an activities director in some of the poorest homes and nursing homes in Philadelphia before they closed them down. And those people were absorbed into nursing homes that were much better off. Okay. And so aging, when I did Not a Jealous Bone, and uh, when I did um, uh, Some Dark Place, I mean, my friend who in Some Dark Place, she has some memory issues. So that's always been one of the scariest things. You work your whole life to try to be someone who you can respect, <laughs> you know, as opposed to somebody who you feel like throwing away, right? You, yeah, exactly. She works so hard, and then she doesn't. She's going to lose who she is. So I got Absolutely. a piece that was positive. They said if she had, just had one memory, may it be a happy one, and um. So it was a happy piece and because of that, because I figure if you only have one memory, just may it be a happy one. And then who cares? But mm -hmm. um, but in Not a Jealous Bone, after I did Possibly, that was me in response to all the old people. Because by the time I left after all those years, almost all the people that I had known were dead from the from my job. They all had died there. Yes. And so that was really kind of an experience that I kind of wanted to write. And oh, so many of these women, especially the very poorest people who didn't were financially had difficulties and who were in some of the worst of the nursing homes, which were really horrendous, um, they would have pictures by their bedside and they would have all these beautiful young women. And I would mm -hmm. ask them, is that your daughter? And they would say, it's my mom. She died right after she gave birth or she died when I was a girl. You know, she, they didn't live that long. And so they always would have this woman and they would be like 80 or 90. And they would have this, they always remembered. And they would talk about it, how strange it is when they think of their mother. They think of someone who's 25. Hmm. That's yeah, that's an interesting perspective. I suppose if you are, uh, it's almost like you are the person you were when you died, rather than the person you are you were throughout your life. Mm. Yeah. So, so that really yeah. had a profound impact on me. And then there's one guy who there's one guy I was very fond of. His name was Tom, and he was a resident, and he was like six five, and he was a big, heavy man. And one day he died, <laughs> and he died in the middle of the living room nurse at the nursing home. And there was a guy who worked in vaudeville and he took, he was, after Tom, he just filled up, you know, you couldn't get past him. You had to step over him. There was nothing to be done. He had a heart attack. And mm -hmm. he couldn't just move him because he was huge. So this one guy had a, bought his cane and he started dancing around his body and said, tough luck, Tom. Poor Tom. <laughs> you are dead, but I'm still alive. So I just put oh. tough luck, mom in there so i didn't even write that song that was written by this guy and who was a resident in a nursing home oh huh. well well that's some um, good heavens that's seems almost every other line or song of your work has some interesting story behind it <laughs> you know, Simon, i'm trying not to make it that way but sometimes it's true yeah, it seems to be, it's definitely. Um, speaking of music, there was another thing I wanted to ask. Um, I know you write lyrics a lot for your work. Have you ever composed music? No. Mm. I sing. Okay. I sing, like to sing. I, mean, I don't have a voice, but I, uh, I like to sing. But no, I don't ever compose it. I could, okay. though. I could. I have thought about it. But oh, uh, no, I'm sure you could. Yeah, I'm sure I could. I mean, I really do believe I could if I wanted to take that role on. Mm, absolutely. I mean, possibly in Michigan was essentially a musical, and 
Uh, I mean, I know you didn't write the lyrics for that, but um, you know, it, it, you can clearly create musical musical pieces. I, I wrote the lyrics to that, except for I did not write the cannibal animal cannibal song. That's All right, yes. Karen Scadini wrote that in total. We sat down and I told her I thought we should do an animal cannibal song. And so mm -hmm. she sat down and she wrote it, wrote it and I would say yes or no or yes or no. Mm -hmm. So it was something of a collaboration, but it wasn't really. It's her song. She's brilliant songwriter. I'm good, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I do a lot of things well, but I um, you know, I don't do anything where I go like that's like really brilliant. She mm -hmm. was brilliant at songwriting. It was it was very powerful, but you know your lyrics are very powerful as well. I can certainly say that. Uh, certainly, <clears throat> I mean one uh, what really um, uh, some lyrics that really stuck with me was the uh, song about "Have you seen my mother?" from "Not a Jealous Bone." It was just oh, yeah. even though it was it was quite lighthearted and kind of uh, springy, it it just it was really moving at the same time. <laughs> uh, absolutely, very well. Done. Actually, that's another recurring theme I've noticed. Well, not recurring. It, it's in two films. But in Mother. Not, a not Yes, Mothers. Not a Jealous Bone, Annie Lloyd. Mothers seem to also recur through in your work. Oh, yeah, they really do. Well, mm. I think it's because my mother was very sick when I was young. And so she wasn't often there and she was complex. And mm. so I was always having to figure out, you know, that when you have a complex mother, you have to have a more complicated road to negotiate. And so I think I've been working on that theme of mother so much of my life. Yeah, I don't think I do yeah. anymore. I mean, I conceivably could go back there. I don't know. I don't even, after it's odd, after I've been afraid, I think about what I want to do and that's pretty lighthearted and contemporary. But I don't know, there's something about me that just feels like doing a piece that's the dark night of the soul. <laughs> like, mm. like the earth took a breath and it hasn't exhaled yet, so you don't know what's going on. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, of course, you are a mother yourself. Has that... Uh, I, I am. Fact I, yes, I, that has, has that factored into your work at all? Your, and how it, has it changed at all? <laughs> yeah. Excuse me. It changed my life, bless you. I, it changed my life enormously. I mean, I first of all, I grew up again with them, so they didn't have the childhood I had. I mean, it wasn't a perfect childhood, but, you know, basically I gave them a pretty good childhood. And mm. um, I don't know. I uh, I asked them the other day if, they, if there was anything that I should ask their forgiveness of or for. You know, because I did the best I could do, but, you know, maybe there's resentments that they have that I – that I could have done better or there's times when I didn't rise to the occasion or that impacted them, you know, that could come back and haunt them in a huge way. Like when you get older, things happen to you and things mm -hmm. come back. They reach across centuries and find you or decades and find you. <laughs> <laughs> it's like most fear. And uh, I, they said, no, they didn't. Uh, they actually didn't strangely have one particularly bad memory. They said, no, that's, yeah, they thought that they, if they wouldn't have been able to love their wives as much as they did, if, you know, if they hadn't loved them so well. That's, well, that is, that is remarkable. Because mm. uh, there are, yeah, let me tell you, there are very few, there are very few children who don't have any resentments. <laughs> I mean, maybe they were lying. <laughs> You know, uh, no, I think they, I feel like when you ask a question like that directly, people are generally pretty honest. At least that's my experience. Yeah, I but yeah. was trying to be. It was a wild experience. I went like, my God. And then I started crying because I felt like I had been feeling such guilt. Like, how could I? <laughs> well, you, yes, well, I think that's, I think that's wonderful. That's me. And speaking of, um, you know, on the subject, sort of, it was one of your films that doesn't, I've read a bunch of articles about your work, but one that people don't seem to talk about much is Suburbs of Eden, um, oh, yeah. which I found um, very, uh, um, because, you know, I'm, I'm not American, obviously, and I really don't know um, much about life in the American suburb, but the, a lot of work about it seems to have a very similar, like, 
uh, theme of um, grimness uh, underneath a pretty veneer, and yours really tapped into that. Yes, it really did. <laughs> it mm. really did. Can I ask if anything in particular inspired it, maybe personal experiences or...? Yeah, well, I, it was in the middle of a very difficult marriage. And yeah. um, I, I usually make women heroes, heroines. I mean, that is one of the things, what is that, on the Zoom the other night, someone asked me if dress is a feminist, if dresses are a feminist, can be a feminist statement, what's in my pocket? And I said <laughs> that, I thought that it was because when I made work, I made sure I didn't leave them in the gutter. Hmm. I made sure that I made them heroes, like they could do anything. And that was something that I have done in every single piece, as far as I know, even with my friend Gail, who has memory issues. I mean, I gave her a happy thought. Absolutely. And you but, really gave her a... She was in some dark place, is that correct? Yeah, some dark place, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that, uh, yeah, but in Suburbs of Eden, the hero that I made her was less obvious. It was somebody who could manage the day-to-day -day and hold forth if it was needed. Mm. Yes, absolutely. That came across very well. Mm. I mean, it's, it wasn't an experience that I personally understand, but it, it's very, it came across very well. And, uh, and would you say that was a bit of, uh, th th this was also somewhat uh, you venting your, frustrations with your marriage i'm sorry that's probably a bit personal yes it, there's there is there is a bit of that in there there was also an assistant mm -hmm. at the time who uh i always have friends and her, she was a, she's a very good friend of mine now you know i was like six years older than her then so i was like in another generation but she was she was um but she when i was filming it uh she said, well, when uh, I was going to have him, this guy yelling and the girl pouting, the husband pouting and the little girl huddled in the corner and, uh, you know, just he screams, you know, the growling scene, which I think is one of my favorite scenes I've ever done. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, she said, well, when I was young, I would be sitting in the other room and I'd hear uh, my her father yelling, she said, and then you'd hear the slap. Oh, goodness. And I went, holy shit. So then <laughs> I just said that. So that's not mm. my experience. That was hers. Yes. That seems to be a recurring thing as well, like you giving a voice to um, the horrid experiences of like your female friends. Like you can I, see that in, yeah. All the time. So, yes. It, it, it comes just, out yeah, that... afraid like crazy too. Mm, mm. Because yes, you know, cause... I ask one friend and then I ask another friend. Yes. It's just, it's just remarkable to think that, um, yeah, you, because you see it in, uh, possibly in Michigan with that cannibal story you told me and, 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 uh, in some dark place and I've been afraid it's it's it really makes you contemplate that any any one of us could have all these women in our lives who just have had similarly horrible experiences who and we just haven't asked them or we haven't looked into it the way you have yeah you know I was surprised when my friend said that because she just looked like such a regular gal and then when mm -hmm. she said that she would hear her father slap her mother and I just was <sighs> Oh my God, to be raised with that. Mm, you know, it's just, it makes, I don't know how to even think about how to be raised with that. Yes, it's dreadful. It's just dreadful. Well, I do um, think you're right. I think I, I give, uh, people can tell me things that I think are really quite amazing, and they do. And maybe mm. I think that's part of what Diane's paintings are about for me, why I so identify with them is that they, this women, these women are there, and they are not really talking, but they all know. Mm. I was yeah, sitting in a pizza place. I was getting a pizza, and I was just sitting at one time, and a woman sat down next to me. She sat clearly next to me because there were other seats. She didn't have to sit next to me. And mm. she just started talking, and then she started saying that she was really, really afraid at this time in her life. And I was going like, oh, wow. This oh, is like call to the birds and then they start landing on your head. Huh. Uh, but there must, I suppose this, 
presumably something about you that just makes people people open up. Mm. I think there is something they must know, you know, like Diane's paintings, they're all hanging around. Mm. Most of my friends don't have anything going on that they've ever mentioned to me because there's nothing going on like that. Uh, but still, you to think that there are. Side. I have a dark side. Of course. Hmm. Don't we all? <laughs> hmm. <laughs> um, so. Uh, <laughs> I had so I had this in my notes, uh, but like I said, I've lost them. So can we briefly go over w- what you studied? Did you study film professionally? No, I studied sculpture and photography. Sculpture mostly, yeah. sculpture and then photography. A master's in photography, undergraduate in sculpture, and I did I did sculptures that were I don't know life size blow-ups of photographs, the cutouts of people, and I put them in environments. Okay. And then yeah. I uh, started making, just photographing the photographs in environments and doing photographs. But I felt like there was something, I knew that I wasn't going to be, I didn't have the potential. I could feel I didn't. I've always felt I had potential in the field. But I never mm. felt I had a tremendous potential in sculpture or photography. I'm not saying I was bad. It's just that I'm a storyteller. And so it wasn't until I became clear to me that I needed to uh, tell stories, which is what happened when I did my first video, Beneath the Skin. I had Mm. stories to tell, and I figured if I didn't tell them, it would be really bad for me. No. No, that absolutely makes sense. So it was Beneath the Skin, your first, your very first instance of working in video. Yeah, yeah, it was. Mm, okay, and it's, well, it clearly worked out for you. It's just funny how we can be drawn to these mediums, even if we didn't study for them. So it's amazing that possibly has been such a hit, and it's made by three gals who didn't know anything. <laughs> yes, now, it's just the character in it is so incredibly strong. Um can I ask uh, if it was your idea to have the women talk in that lilting sing-song tone? Sure, it was. Well, you see, yeah. what happened was um, I, I, I wrote a script, and, and you know, I, that's just the working model. And I took everybody to an, uh, you know, to a mall where they gave me fifteen minutes to do whatever I needed to do before the store opened, and mm-hmm. I, uh, which was still a huge gift. So we had to go back so many times for anything to see where we, what looked well, the lighting, you know, because I couldn't bring lights. And um, I, I, it, it, the first, the first song in the piece, other than Animal Cannibal, was mm-hmm. when she said she put her poodle one time, and that's mm-hmm. a thing that I had planned to be said, but in the department store, nobody. It sounded so dumb. So then I got, I asked Karen if she could put some of these words to music. And she wrote a terrific little song. And when it came to post-production time, the guy who did the post-production says there's a a buzz in there I can't get rid of. And so uh, she had to write it again. So she just threw this little thing together. Oh, that's remarkable. And from there, you just, did the rest of the lines, the lines in that same sing-song way? Yeah, like hello, hello, mm. hello, hello. A... <laughs> yes, that was. Yeah, everything, mm. and then also the thing that the, it was six other women who had been killed before her. Mm. She would be, have been the seven. Oh yes. But even like yeah. silly things, you know, like a friend of mine was. Uh, I was telling her I had to shoot the scene at the end, you know, because I had to round up the piece. So I needed to do them eating Arthur and also putting him away in a trash bag and putting him out, you know, that whole thing. Because the fight was <laughs> done. And uh, uh, she said, what are you going to do around the table? I said, I thought they'd just eat after they killed him. And she says, they have to be naked. Mm. And I said, they have to be naked? She says, trust me, they have to be naked. <laughs> so I... <laughs> <laughs> Karen and Jill got there. They said, yes, as long as nothing really shows. So that's what happened. Nice. Who was it that suggested that again? I'm so sorry. There was a woman named Amy Crick who was at my workplace, Amy Crick. Oh. She, she's a, a, a woman who was uh, 
I guess one of the technical directors at the Cleveland Institute of Art where I was teaching. And she had seen the piece, and I, she says, look, it's got to be naked. You just have to trust me. It's got to be naked. <laughs> it's so funny. So then I walked out and shot it naked as I could. Oh, that is, <laughs> oh, you know, and oh, it works so well. It, well, it you all works. You have to be naked. <laughs> you so still you come... have to be. <laughs> <laughs> it just comes together so well. It really does. It's funny how these little, how in so much famous art, the some of the most iconic things are just thrown in at the last minute. <laughs> yeah, but you see, it also seems when you think of it, it's almost like it's fortuitous. It is. That, yeah. You know that a piece has its own mind. It knows what it wants, and it, the universe throws it at you. <laughs> Absolutely. You can't Absolutely. miss it if you have ears. <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely true. And yours just came together so well. Yeah, that was it. But it was real work. I mean, it was it just looks like it was a charm to put together. It was I was I bone tired when I did that one. I could hardly do move for a month. Well, you, it was, I would tell you it was worth it because that is unironically one of the best short films I've seen in my life. It's oh, just, a, thank you. Thank just you. a remarkable piece of work. So one more question. Are you working on anything at the moment? I, I am. I'm always working on something, but it doesn't mean that things lead me places. Like I'm mm. working on um, a thing where... I don't know. It's, it takes place in the woods. And I'd say that usually the, when I use woods, I use like really beautiful woods. <laughs> but here in Wisconsin, where I'm living and where I can't go to like Ireland or exotic places to film in the, out in rocks or wherever, that I, I seem to be drawn to sort of strange things. And it's kind of makes me feel like I'm talking about all the stuff in my life that I usually keep at bay. And so I'm not sure what I'm doing yet. But I sometimes think I'm dealing with the dark night of the soul, which really doesn't have very much humor to it at all. And I don't know why I would do it, except for that I did I've Been Afraid, and that was so lighthearted that I really feel like clobbering it. But I don't know, because nothing I've shot could go in the piece at all. Really? Hmm. I do this sometimes, even though it's very pretty. Oh. So, um, let's see. Can I ask where you shot some dark place then? Because that seemed very lush and pretty. Yes, that, that was in a friend's back, my friend Gail Ziven's backyard. Oh, huh. well, it's very oh, lovely she, garden. Yeah, <laughs> she gave me half an hour. She just walked down with her little blue thing on. And she, I said, hey, I have to leave, but, you know, can you just give me an hour and a half? And she mm -hmm. says, do I have to? I said, yes. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, she gave me half an hour. Oh, lovely. And what about those little shots of the woods in I've Been Afraid? Are those also in Wisconsin? Um, uh, the, the landscapes were all shot by my one. I have a son who led an expedition into the North, uh, uh, in the Alaskan Arctic. And uh, oh. I gave him a GoPro so he could film landscape and the guys that were there. So I... I, I have never used those landscape shots he shot in a piece before, but I loved them. So That's then cool. I just put like emojis on like the wolf howling, and you know, like that dinosaur blowing smoke at that guy who had a rock he on his head. As though mm. it was impenetrable and, you know, just like chairs over that landscape. <laughs> Yes, no, it it was just so well done. Yeah, the, those landscapes. I think I know which ones you mean. Yes. Um, what about the otherwise, abandoned? Otherwise, oh, they were upon. in Mexico because I stayed in Mexico and I did shot oh. most everything else in Mexico. Oh really? Hmm. I didn't think Mexico was that lush. <laughs> oh uh, uh, yes, it, it is. Well, I mean, yeah. well, there was one house, you know, with the legs kicking, and that's when I say I I was afraid I might kill you. That was Philadelphia. Yes. That's my hometown, Philadelphia. Where okay. Oh. And uh, yeah, that was a very, uh, it was a very creepy shot, actually. Is that an yeah. abandoned house somewhere? Yeah, it was very close to the house I grew up in. Very close oh. to down the block. Well, that one was very haunting, especially with the little masks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, screaming. The woods had yeah. a character. That woods had a character. Mm. 
Yes, that was remarkable. Um, well, I won't keep you much. I won't keep you any longer. Um, I dare say you've a great deal to do, and you must uh, get uh, keep making the, the, this remarkable stuff you do because the world really needs it. Do you think you'll uh, upload your next work on YouTube? Well, pardon? Oh, yes, I will. Oh, fantastic! Because <laughs> we all need to see it. <laughs> well, I don't know. This is like this strange piece. I mean, I don't know. Like you know, like I always feel like I do these horrific little pieces. And I try to make them at least a little lighthearted and a little humorous because I always have believed humor is like the highest form of intelligence in work. But I, uh, I, uh, on this one, I, I don't know how funny I am. I'm not sure if I'm just not a sledgehammer. We'll see what I do with it. Well, I really think your stuff yeah. balances, balances creepy and uh, funny very well. <laughs> uh, but. But thank you so much for talking to me. This has been uh, some the most fascinating forty five minutes of my life. <laughs> uh, I say that I say that unironically. Oh, uh, thank, you. thank you, thank you, thank, uh, thank you. you so much, Miss Condit. I really appreciate this. And and Simon, you must send me a link when you write something because you write so well. Oh, thank you. I'm I thinking of making it. Right. You're funny. <laughs> I'm thinking of making a YouTube video, actually. Um, you are. Because that's, yeah, that's the trendy thing now. Um, oh, so I will send that to you when it's done. Please do. Please mm. do. Yes, thank you again, Miss Condit. This was fascinating. Okay, well, thank you very much. Okay. Have a great day. Have a great morning, ma'am. <laughs> you too. Rest of your, rest of your night. Thank you. Bye. Bye.